relying on it to save us uh, from catastrophic climate change. Um, but anyway, uh, so one of the main parts of us achieving the emissions reductions uh, under the Paris Agreement uh, is to preserve forests, maintain forests, and preserve resilience, and all this stuff, all that jazz. And uh, one person that's been at the cutting edge of um, of trying to prevent uh, illegal harvesting and trade in timber, particularly uh, employing many methods, working with many teams across the world. It's an amazing thing. No doubt, testament to, to this. Uh, she is a esteemed uh, lawyer from Fire, which is a wonderful organisation that does um, they work on the environment, there's lots of uh, environmental lawyers there working to um, save the planet. Uh, Emily was once a Greenpeace and worked on agriculture and food systems at that time, it's true, yeah. And uh, she's a, she was also here and she was, uh, was taught here and after formative years, I think. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, great. So, Take it away. It's it's her last day tomorrow at Planet Earth. Uh, and she's moving on to Parliament to help them sort out things there. So, <laughs> <laughs> so let's see. Thanks. How the law saves forests. From that introduction, let's see where we go. <laughs> um, hi. Um, so, uh, it is true. So, tomorrow is my last day <coughs> in this job. So it's a slightly strange time to be giving this presentation, but let's see how we go with it anyway. Um, I've been at Clans for the last seven and a half years. I was, let's be clear, taught by both of these two. So um, all, the, all the pros and all the cons, uh, I credit and blame. Thank you very much. Um, I've also, I mean, here missed out that she was also at and was part of the beginning of this program of forest work. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of background in that. What I wanted to do was give, just to try and give a snapshot of the work that the client has. Is there a clear? That may be asking for too much. Yeah, no, okay. No. Can I click over here? <laughs> <laughs> Can I press a button? May I press a button? The power says a button. Okay, I don't know what you mean. You mean that one works? Oh, it's too soon. Oh, okay. So, how do I make it? Ah! Well, that's just funny. <laughs> so, even when it works, I'm foxed. Um, I don't really want to sit behind a desk, but I guess I can. Um, okay. Um, I wanted to give a little update on the work that Client Earth does. I was trying to think how to do it. And the best I could think of was giving a couple of snapshots and trying to explain some of the methodologies along the way. Um, to give a little bit of the reasons for work, working on forests are probably clear. Let me just check. Has anyone here heard of Client Earth as an organization? OK. And does anyone here do work which connects with forests? OK. Um, in which case, I was going to take these three case studies, ideas, um, bits of work, benefit sharing, conversion, and illegal logging, just to give a little sense of, of the work that the team does. Um, really happy to take questions as we go, really happy for questions at the end, whatever works for people. Um, so the first on why forests, there are a ridiculous number of reasons for why we work on forests. Uh, that is some of them. The, we did an exercise in the team a couple of days ago on, well, Friday last week, on what people's motivations were, what the kind of purpose of working on forests was. The one that came out most dominantly for the people who work in the team was environmental and social, social justice issues. Um, all of them are reflected in elements of these points. The numbers are all contestable, but uh, they're somewhere in the ballpark of something. Um, 
why from the EU or have from the EU or with which leg legitimacy as we work in the EU? So the background, I started working in client earth, working on illegal logging, working on illegal logging regulation that the EU brought in. I'll, I'll come to it at the end. Um, it was historically the main driver of deforestation, and within that, the EU was a significant and driving market, both in terms of volume and in terms of value, so higher value for the timber that came to the EU. Um, that's changed. 50 to 70 percent of tropical deforestation now comes from agricultural conversion. Some people put those numbers higher. There are arguments for 80 percent. There, are, you can go each way you want. Um, of that, half is driven by overseas demand. There are people who, again, would argue that number was higher, and if you try and find the numbers on it, of the, the value behind it, that, that overseas demand is also higher than the half. Um, and there's a ballpark number which is based on a lot of assumptions, which are also all contestable, of more or less 61 billion uh, US dollars being the value of those exports. The EU, from the period of 1998 to 2010, was the dominant importer for those agricultural commodities. So you're talking about things like soy, palm, uh, beef, leather, cocoa, sugar. Um, the EU was the main market. Those market trends are changing. Uh, so the EU is becoming increasingly less important as uh, a demand-side market for those products, but it's still very important also in terms of the value, even if the market share is going down a little. The, the fundamental basis of the work that Client Earth does is it's balanced on, on two sides. Um, on the one hand, you've got weak forest governance, and on the other hand, you've got market regulation, which doesn't require markets to discriminate between the products that they're consuming on the basis of uh, their production characteristics. So this market here isn't capable of caring enough, and uh, forest governance systems aren't required to be strong enough, and there's an interplay between these two. And it's the reason for the interplay that the client earth work is based both in the EU and the UK, depending on what the UK's position is within the EU in due course, um, and also in a sample selection of forested countries. Sample selection because we've only been doing this work for the last seven or eight years. Uh, there was a lot to learn. Uh, there still is a lot to learn. Um, we work in depth in a few countries rather than lightly in a lot. Where are you working? In um, Ghana. Liberia, Ivory Coast, Republic of Congo, historically in Gabon, and then for some other bits of work around the place, then we end up working much more lightly in the DRC, in Cameroon, Vietnam, some other places. Why couldn't you leave those countries? Was there a reason for that? Yeah, yeah, there was. There was so the EU has a policy framework. Step back a moment. Um, the way that we are using the law to try and influence both the market regulation and the forest governance, it's a useful tool, but on its own it isn't enough. There isn't enough of an incentive, a, a, a hook, for the sort of work that we're doing to work in a policy vacuum. So we needed, in all cases, there to be some other mechanism, policy mechanism or trade mechanism, whatever it was, that would give us the point of intervention. In this case, what there was was a policy framework from the EU called the Flegged Forest Law Enforcement, Governance and Trade uh, Policy, which started off doing bilateral trade agreements with particular forested countries with a view to using that as a mechanism for improving their forest governance. And so it was off the back of this that we entered into the discussion in those countries because effectively they created a forum and they created a demand also for a multi-stakeholder process. Um, and I'll come on to it. The way that we've worked has been very much initially through and with civil society supporting their legal capacity to engage. So it's 
imagine there has been a governance table, a governance forum that's been created, and we've taken that opportunity to intervene. Um, I think this picture is now changing. When we started this work, a lot of the climate conversations, a lot of the commodity conversations were important, but they were slightly less tangible. Um, this has changed a little bit, so it creates, I guess, more more ways of engaging, but also a little more confusion about how to engage in a way which really works. Um, so ultimately what the project, what the team does, is find ways to use law to strengthen forest governance on the one hand, market regulation on the other, but most particularly to use the interplay between the two. Um, I thought Fie is going to recognize a couple of people in there. Um, to explain also how we work in the African countries where we work. So in the EU, uh, the team has uh, a number of lawyers who are from EU countries and based either in London or in Brussels and work directly towards EU institutions, member states, with NGOs, towards private sector organizations. So it's a direct working relationship. Where we are working on forest governance in Africa, one of the questions which had to be worked out was, well, what is the role of a bunch of EU-based lawyers in this? What's the legitimacy? What's the purpose? What's the, what's the function? Um, and this was, again, at the time that uh, Fier was, was at Client Earth, and it was not a straightforward process at all to land on the mode of intervention that would work and feel right and um, sort of resonate with the people that we were working with and the way that the team wanted to achieve um, impact as well. What we came to, what the team came to was what we call legal working groups. Effectively, our first point of intervention has been working with civil society um, or community representatives within these policy or legal reform frameworks to uh, increase their willingness, ability, desire, sense of uh, potential opportunity to engage in legal reform processes. Why? Because if you talk about doing legal reform and you give people a seat at the table, it doesn't make much difference if they don't understand the language and they don't feel that it's accessible. So the purpose really is legal capacity building um, to increase a sense of engagement, to increase knowledge of the law, to increase an ability to engage with and manipulate the law to represent the rights that people have and want to uh, exert. It has meant in, in really basic terms, the first thing that has happened in each of the countries as we've started working there is we have spent a lot of time talking to national groups, normally finding national platforms of existing civil society uh, groups and inviting people to be part of a legal working group. It's entirely voluntary, it's entirely unpaid, it is to be useful to people who want to have access to this skill set. Um, the mechanism of deciding what the subject matter is that the legal working groups work on is in part correlated to this um, trade agreements which are being negotiated with the EU, but are also a question of coming upon, I mean, essentially mutually agreeing a pathway. So it is the members of the legal working group that get to select what the focus of the work is. We work with a national lawyer, at least one national lawyer in each of the countries that we work with, uh, and they are partnered with a lawyer who is based either in London or in Brussels. So they are as much of a part of the team as anyone who is based in London. Um, and it is through this mechanism that the members of the legal working group effectively have the opportunity to work on different legal issues that come up that are particularly important to these trade agreements. The trade agreements, it's probably important to recognize, have sought to, their purpose is to get timber, to create a system which recognizes timber as being legally harvested. 
and then for the EU to be able to accept that as legally harvested timber, uh, which it accepts at face value. To do that has required in each country a complete scrutiny of what is legal. Uh, how do you judge it? How do you assess it? How do you certify it? How can you have confidence in it? And what role do different stakeholders have along the way in coming to that conclusion? Um, it is the, UK, uh, the EU, excuse me, the EU and each of the relevant countries. So, uh, Ghana, Liberia. Yeah, exactly. Um, was already existing, but it wasn't implemented, or was it because illegal logging in those times? Yeah. And they're illegal for a reason, because there was a law that was illegal. Well, actually, and that's one of the things that I'll come on to, because I think you've got the question of, is something illegal because it's, there's a law and it uh, says, so you, it says you must do this and you do this, or is something illegal when something is happening but there's no legal framework to govern it? Or is it a law when you've got some customary rights existing on the one hand, you've got a statutory law that exists here, and there's a clash between the two? Um, all of these are contested and contentious and contested within this process. One of the things that these trade agreements have sought to do is to reach a consensus at the national level on what legal is. Client Earth, to be very clear, was no part in creating these uh, trade agreements. All we have done is stepped into the space that they have created uh, to work with others in working through that. And in working through that, our role has been working very much with civil society and with community representatives to make sure that their perspectives on what is legal is part of the conversation. So, as I, I mean, each country we have started off by trying to find the law, first of all and then try to unpick what that law is and what it should be and where the differences are in it. To an extent. Not to the nth degree. Um, so it is also, and this is led in each of the countries where we're working by the stakeholders we're working with, to the extent that they want to have that conversation, we end up having that conversation. Um, but it is part of our job to put that on the table as an issue. Um, let me come on to benefit sharing because it maybe is a nice way of, of illustrating it. Um, the, uh, top line stuff on benefit sharing which you're possibly probably all familiar with but a right to share in the benefits derived from the use of land which can be afforded to um, those who own the land or have use rights to the land so already we get into um, unclear territory, or territory which can become unclear very quickly. Um, who is responsible for making the payment? If it is a payment, it doesn't have to be a payment, it doesn't have to be money, it can be something other than money, it doesn't have to be financial. But, and it can be called in some countries, we talk about it as social agreements, other countries benefit sharing, again all of this will, will differ. Um, the question of there are many questions that go with this that you can imagine. Who is the recipient of the benefit? What should the benefit be? How is it agreed? What happens if it isn't enforced or paid or provided? What if there's a dispute about what the benefit might be or should be? Uh, what if it is provided to someone and someone else thinks it's provided to the wrong people? All of these things. Who is the community? Who is the representative? Um, No, so this is somewhere else. So if you imagine that the trade agreement created a framework, so these, and they're called voluntary partnership agreements. So they create a framework and they say, these are the laws that need to be uh, complied with for timber to be legal. And then it gets to the point where you go, well, this is fine in principle because there is a provision in an act of parliament for a particular country that says you need to make a benefit sharing agreement if you're going to use the land. What we came across most often is the detail of how that works isn't, uh, isn't set out. So you don't have the mechanism, you don't have 
the nuts and the bolts of how does this work in practice, the difficult stuff. It's easy to put a, an agreement for a benefit sharing agreement in law. It's m much more difficult to go through the process of creating an agreement about what should it look like and how should it work. Um, so the voluntary partnership agreements, the trade agreements, have been effectively an opportunity to dig into this issue. They've created a space where you say, well, we need timber to be legal, benefit sharing agreements are one of the legal requirements, but there seems to be a gap here in the national legal framework because no one really knows what should happen, and even if they think they know what should happen, communities aren't necessarily doing the greatest job of representing their own interests to the fullest extent. Uh, so how do you go about resolving that, or at least trying to resolve that, starting the process of resolving that? I, I should say also, all of this is recognizing that none of the, none of the outputs of this are 100% perfect. They are all exercises of trying to make systems better, uh, make the law work better for multiple interests, rather than finding an ideal solution, which is um, not challengeable on many, many levels. I give you a, a table of people who are legal working group members in Liberia working on this issue at the time uh, for social agreements as it stands in Liberia. Um, the background in Liberia is this, companies have to pay land rent to communities by entering into a social agreement. What has happened, and Liberia is a great example of a country which has quite a lot of law written at the top level and a very poor effort so far in having quite a lot of the law really detailed into implementing decrees that work in practice. So a lot of the framework there sits in principle, a lot of the detail is lacking. Um, in this case, the law is there and no one the level of understanding and knowledge of the law has been very light. So how do you get it to work in practice? How do you share information about how the law can work and should work? The legal working group, so this is members of different community organisations in this context, uh, working with a national lawyer and also working with uh, this guy who's Jeff, who's based now in Brussels, um, produced a set of guidance. Now again, there is a national union, a national union of community forest development committees. It is a mouthful. This is a, a fantastic thing to have as a starting point because it is exactly as it sounds. It is a national union which represents the interests of the development committees across the country. To understand how this works in practice, because this is the union that in the first instance was receiving some of the money as a benefit, uh, the benefit from the social agreements. In practice, there was one individual who was trusted by a lot of the development committees who held the bank account details for all of the money that was coming in for them. It's an interesting practice and it, it worked for a lot of ways. There was a lot of trust between the different development committees. It's not a system you want to break down just for the sake of it, but equally what it shows is how not resilient and how much lack of depth there is in terms of the infrastructure that supports the way that this works. Um, this is one of the things which is being worked on to have a more systematic system for, for distributing the benefits, but it, it, I found it a fascinating snapshot of um, just how light touch the system was, just how fragile it is effectively. There's one person who, who plays such a key role in a system which goes across the entire country. He's also someone, as an aside, who um, got investigated by the police because he had control of a bank account which had so much money in it. So there are other issues that come out of the side of all of this. But anyway, so the, the guidance which has been produced and has been produced and is now being shared, worked on, disseminated, people are doing, we're doing trainings and others are doing trainings, sort of cycling it out. To 
set out the absolute basics, the nuts and bolts. What is the legal framework that defines this? What are communities' rights? What can they ask for? What are the prices? What are the sorts of benefits that they should or could be getting as a result of the use of their land? And this is all to do with the social agreement with a company. Exactly. So if a community is to negotiate a social agreement with a company, how shall it best represent its interests? Um, how shall it best think about its representation, if that isn't already something which is agreed? But also, what, what might a contract look like? What could a template contract actually look like? What are key terms? One of the things that has often been an issue to date is they are simply not enforceable. You write a lot of things down and there was nothing about what happens if the company doesn't pay what it said it would pay. Basic provisions which have to be tested to make sure they work, of course, so writing down the enforcement provisions doesn't make them work, but it starts making it stronger. Not brilliantly, no, uh, but not impossibly either. And this is something which is starting in Liberia, because Liberi Liberian law, better than quite a lot of other countries in that, that part of the world, have got quite strong provisions for communities to represent themselves. Would it happen well every time? No, of course not. But is there a legal remedy there? Yes. And are there enough le lawyers who can begin to start working on that as well? Yes. Um, but no pretense there. It is not a perfect system. There would have to be an awful lot of um, fuss made to make sure that it actually works. Um, it's a balancing act. So the social agreement, one of the things that was um, one of the most contentious questions in the, the template agreement which was agreed was how long should it last for? Um, how long should it last for because if you have it for longer, on the one hand uh, this works better because you think you have better security going forwards, but equally if the way the company exploits the land changes over time and their income from the land goes up, then you can't reflect that very easily. In a, I mean, you could create an agreement that would, but that would be harder. So that was one of the most contentious issues, as you can imagine, the middle way was kind of found in terms of, I think it's five years as an agreement. The historic ones, you have to wait for them to finish and then renegotiate. So this isn't a quick fix. It isn't, a, um, it isn't that all other social agreements fall and then these become the de facto method, but rather it's become a template which can be used. Yes. Uh, when we talk about direct payments, when we talk about land grant payments? Direct payments in which sense? The municipal payment sense doesn't go through the central government. No. Then no. It comes to, so this is that role of that one individual. It goes into bank accounts which are linked to uh, the development committees as opposed to going to the government. Um, this is one which uh, was a slog and uh, continues going slowly. Um, Gabon is a country that we were working in from 2012, I want to say, I'm not sure. Um, the Forest Code outlines a benefit sharing system. It says that benefits should be shared, quite simply, but it doesn't say anything about the details, how to agree them, what level should they be at, all the rest of it. So the legal working group working with national lawyer and our lawyer at the time um, worked through what they thought it should look like. What were the key components? What should what percentage of the um, profits that the company is making felt like the right level? In 2014, and it isn't to. There is a lot of chance, of course, with this that um, this sort of petition came along at a time when the Gabonese government was interested in making progress on this and where the lack of it was causing a bit of conflict, so there was a purpose. Um, but the Ministry of Forestry then passed the legal text, which was the implementing decree, which set out a series of the provisions for how benefit sharing agreements should work in practice. Fine, absolutely great in practice, but then what do you do with it? Um, in Gabon, the system is different. You need the uh, community, you need the company and you also need the national regulator at the local level to agree the social agreement. So unless you have those three, it doesn't stand. So you then, the next thing that we did and we sort of, 
So for the client earth work, it was effectively training the trainers. So creating a group of people who then were working with national groups across the country uh, in different communities to do technical training on exactly how to come to these agreements. The Ministry of Forest has endorsed the guide. They did this a little while ago. The practice that we came to was by the time we finished one of the elements of the project, there were a few of the agreements had, that had been signed and settled. And the, I suppose the heartening thing that came with it was there was also a, a, effectively a waiting list of others that wanted to get involved and wanted to start using the benefit sharing agreement and the guidance. All of that has to be taken in the context, however, that the Gabonese uh, forest code is contentious and changing and difficult to pin down and constantly under reform and things change at the last minute. So the reason for focusing on benefit sharing has been that it is a relatively small but sharp tool. It is something which directly impacts community rights, community benefit. And if it works better as a tangible way of also demonstrating use or land rights or ownership rights um, that those communities have. Well, that's one of the, the fun things, which is different in different countries. Um, sometimes they can get a permit, and the permit is conditional on the agreement being entered into subsequently. But as you can imagine, what is lacking in very many cases is a mechanism to check that. Um, when you map out, I mean, benefit sharing, we think of classically, it started around timber. Um, it then becomes relevant to agricultural use. It is being discussed and thought about in terms of carbon rights and others now. It is one approach which can potentially find a balance between different uses going on of the same resource or the same land but it is highly contentious and it is the mechanism by which those benefit sharing agreements are agreed and then the role that they play down the line is very contentious um, so it is almost simplest in the world of timber and as soon as you move away from there it gets much more complicated I wanted to talk about um, forest conversion a bit partly because well Partly because forest conversion is now the driving cause of at least tropical deforestation. Um, it's also, at least for now, the EU remains the largest importer of those uh, conversion-driven commodities. So it is a question for, uh, for this work. It has been a question of a, a legitimacy in terms of action and a responsibility that one can ascribe to the EU's role um, in terms of addressing these problems. The thing, from a, from a forest law perspective, forest conversion classically isn't regulated. So regulations exist for the governance of selective logging, logging or for protected areas, or for particular use of forests. Forest conversion is a relatively new phenomenon, not particularly anymore, but relatively new phenomenon. And what has been lacking has been an update to the legal reform, uh, to the forest, forest laws, to create a framework that sets out, well, how does it happen? Who can, who can uh, convert forests on what terms, in, in which way? Uh, so in none of the countries where we work could you get a proper forest conversion permit and yet forests are being converted. Instead, other permits are being substituted, are being used in the place and are being um, uh, it, it is to work around the system because the system doesn't work for how the, the land is being used. In some ways you can say it's appropriate, uh, it is a practical way of doing things, it is to not stop the way that people want to use the land. In another sense, it is, means it is unregulated and the rights and responsibilities that go with the way that the forests are being converted 
are very unclear um, and it leads to a, a strong question of what is legal and how do you define it and what happens in the grey zone. From the EU perspective, um, we have all sorts of voluntary non-binding commitments that say we will stop deforestation associated with commodity supply chains. Um, some of them are by 2020, and given that it's nearly 2019, this is obviously relatively ambitious. Um, one of the criticisms, and it is a fair criticism that comes with these, is the, these are easy things to say and these are very difficult things to do, and the companies and the groups that have made these commitments uh, without exception, I cannot think of a single one that I can think of that will um, actually achieve these sorts of um, commitments. Um, the New York Declaration on Forests, which says it wishes to halve deforestation by 2020 and end it by 2030, I go down to the IPCC special report which says global emissions decline have to happen well before 2030. These numbers don't make sense. Um, the, the, the urgency that the deforestation is being addressed with versus what the climate modelling says, obviously they don't work together. But all of this is also happening in the context where, um, let me take the example of Ivory Coast. In Ivory Coast, you have a country which has pledged to increase its forest cover by 30%, uh, to increase its economic development from natural resources, including forest cover, by 30% and to increase the amount of uh, carbon which is captured by land use by 20 to 30%, I can't remember the number, but something like this. And if you map out from these numbers and you just take a look at the land use policies which do or don't exist in this particular country, it doesn't add up. There isn't a system. Please. Doesn't Bloomberg all these regions and force governments to create a national parks or say like if there aren't any how is deforestation measured? Yeah. It's a beautiful question and there's no good answer. Um, the international treaties don't deal with it sufficiently. So the way that... Uh, are you thinking of the climate sort of treaties? Or are you thinking... No, in general, the EU treaties in these countries that all you have to... So the EU, the EU agreement with these countries is about the trade of timber. What the EU treaty, the EU um, trade agreement with these countries do not go as far as saying you must uh, stop deforestation. The sorts of things that you have with the. Amsterdam Declaration, for example, or the New York Declaration are voluntary entered into commitments by particular countries or indeed the EU, which say we will walk towards uh, finding solutions that will slow or halt deforestation by this point. Um, the EU is, I suppose, treading to, to be generous to the EU. It is trying to find a balance between what it can legitimately ask of other countries. So how can the EU ask another country to stop deforestation when deforestation is a, a, a fundamental aspect to many countries of economic de development? So what is the, the balance between these two things? So the EU has uh, not at any point said to, for example, Ivory Coast, please stop deforestation. Please. Does that ever come into a uh, question if, for example, they're agreeing yeah, I mean, there's a there's a really good example at the moment with the different country, different uh, different part of the world, but Indonesia. So at the moment, the EU is negotiating a trade agreement with Indonesia, and you have all of the different chapters. Palm oil is incredibly important to the economy of Indonesia. So. Um, each party has its own respective interests uh, and a desire to ease trade. The language on the, and it's in the 
it's also interesting where it sits in these agreements. So this is in the Trade and Sustainable Development chapter uh, of the trade agreement with the EU. And what that says is pretty much the EU and Indonesia commit to doing things which are good for sustainable forestry. It would be extraordinarily contentious. The Indonesian party's representatives would walk away from the table if the EU tried to say, um, in doing this, you have to stop deforestation. And, and I'll, I was going to come on to it at the end, but uh, let me say one thing and then. Um, the, UK, the EU's got its own problems. So the EU is deforesting as it wishes in many places without making these equations add up for itself. So there is also, it would be harder still to make that argument to Indonesia given the way that uh, we promote and have a, a strong and vocal, well, a vocal at least, uh, forestry sector in the EU. I promise the EU is not trying to do that. <laughs> I can assure everyone. Can you imagine? <laughs> and then I'd have to shoot myself. Um, sorry. Is it too simplistic to say that in most countries there is forest legislation? Uh, they gazette their forests, the gazette will identify the physical buttons of the forest, so the regulations made under the Forest Act will define exactly what you can and can't do. So, in principle, governments have complete control over activities. If they choose not to exercise that control or don't have the resources with which to do so, it's another thing. But the principle is clear enough it's state land and the state decides what it should or shouldn't do it. And what if it isn't state land? Or what if, take Ghana, it's a lovely example, the state can own the let me get this the right way around, I'll get it the wrong way around. The state can own the land and the communities can own the forests. The trees on the forest on the land. So and this I mean this is it's not a I'm not making that up, or if I am, it's an example which is almost right. Um, this is and what happens stuck with the forest regulations. If the regulations recognise customary rights, there's no problem. If the regulations don't recognise customary rights, then there is a problem. Because the regulations are designed to persuade a court and that's that's definitely one approach that something sorry please no that's exactly the problem because especially with like mining areas where the state allocates of licenses right it de facto becomes uh, the jurisdiction goes out of the sovereign uh, like powers of the state because it's trade in, uh, in agreements and investment agreements got involved with the license itself. And if there's some uh, attempt from the central government of expropriation, yep. it will be sued out of the country. So that, that like, de facto like, makes the state much less powerful in the sense of... It does. I mean, it, when I think when that happens, I, I completely agree. It, it challenges roles. But if you... St- 
step back a bit and take benefit sharing agreements because they it is it, they matter because they matter to what is the fundamental process. Um, if you allocate an area of land to someone to use and they don't follow through and they don't do the benefit sharing agreements possibly, where does that concession stand now? Um, you could argue the company has been allowed to continue to use it and therefore has a legitimate use to be expect to expect to be able to continue to use it because it hasn't been challenged by the government or effectively by the community uh, for its non-compliance with the benefit sharing framework. You could argue that the benefit sharing agreement uh, framework was sufficiently unclear that it's not fair to ask the company to do anything. You could equally argue that the company's right to use that land is fundamentally undermined by its failure to comply properly with the benefit sharing uh, framework. There's a legitimacy to all of those arguments and it's in that legitimacy and the kind of the relative strength and voice of the different stakeholders at the time that the difference comes along. But also, and I wish I had a different picture of it, I, I have another map which I would love to have right now because I, um, what do you do then when you have a forest concession which is granted, let's imagine over here, but then you also have a mining concession which is allocated overlapping with the same area of land. And then you have an agricultural concession which is allocated over the same piece of land. This happens. This happens frequently. So the role of the state is compromised, but the role of the communities are compromised and the role of the companies are compromised. And do the, do the different ministries realise what they're doing? Without consideration. I, mean, I, I couldn't possibly right. comment, but I'll leave you to imagine. Um, there, there isn't an effective framework to... Where can I take as an example? Cameroon, it's a really good example. Um, ministries do not have enough incentive to work together, because if they can grant those permits, and they can grant them, and to be blunt, if they can receive the money that comes from the granting of the permits, they're winning. Uh, there are, there is a very slightly flawed but slightly decent uh, setup for an interministerial communication and consultation that should happen when one ministry is granting, for example, the mining ministry uh, grants land to use in a forest area. But does it happen? No. Um, should it happen? Yes. What do you do if it doesn't happen? How does the person who has benefited from or thinks they have that permit and thinks they have the ability to exploit the permit, what do they do? And what do you do if a ministry uh, grants a permit to use in an area they don't have an authority to grant the permit in? Can the company rely on the expectation that the ministry surely isn't granting permits where it doesn't have the right? Or it, does it become the job of companies to, to check each one? except if it's the general practice which has been going on for the last 20 years would you or wouldn't you and of course it comes with investment risk of course it does but at the same time this is practice and this is common and this is going on and this ultimately goes to land use and land use planning which is something which is I guess the, I, I brought up forest conversion as the precursor to um, land use planning which remains underneath a lot of these issues and remains um, Grey, in terms of its uh, uh, systemic structure. Uh, can you share if there are some examples where the benefit sharing models are completely backfired and uh, result in complete opposite of what is intended? Something, something like that. Um, I mean, there are lots of examples where benefit sharing agreements have been entered into at quite a low level, a level which was felt to be unfair with hindsight by those that negotiated it from the community's perspective. Um, you've got some examples in the Republic of Congo where that's led to conflicts where um, representatives have <coughs> sought to prevent the use by the companies that had the permit to use it. Um, that's actually that's happening more in the Republic of Congo, a little bit in Cameroon that I'm aware of. I'm sure there are other examples of it. It's still in the minority of cases that this happens, but it is there now. It's a it's a, it's a trend which has happened. How does the company ever know, the community ever know, what the bedding it is that it's supposed to be sharing? Can they require the company to account for the revenue generated by it? They can ask for it. 
and they can ask to have that. That's one of the things that needs to be dealt with in the template agreement. Yes. How do they know? And are you dealing with it? Because you could deal with it, you could do an inventory of the forest. So I can see how much timber there is, and I can understand the value of it. So I will make the projection of the value as of what I see today. Or you can say, I'm going to wait for the timber to be harvested. I'm going to measure it. I'm going to calculate the volume, and I'm going to do it on that basis. Or you can say, I'm going to do it on the, the value of the company's profits. Um, in which case, you've got the hardest time getting the information. They can try, but there's the balance of power thing and all of this. So your easiest op option is to do the inventory. I suppose you can try and have some independent auditor who comes in to measure up. Well, absolutely, you could, but good luck having some communities in certain mm -hmm. further further away areas finding the independent auditor who will come in and have the. I mean, you can, and this is it's, it's a good approach. It's not always practical, but if you can, it's a good one. Yeah, I, in this sense, I was already interested how you try to represent different parties and stakeholders because I mean, you were talking about the grass cutting between, you know, the dilemma having um, um, a company and a government and yeah. you know, community sharing the same space. Yeah. So do you try to bring them, you know, at the same, at the same table, or is it really focused on communities? That's no, it, how, um, it's it's communities. I mean, the work started from a civil society community perspective, yeah. but why the analysis was these are the stakeholders who are least likely to have uh, as good access to legal capacity skills, legal experts, and all the rest of it. But of course it doesn't work unless the whole system works. Um, yeah. So let me let me go back a bit because um, I just... Ba, ba, ba. Okay, um, blah, 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 conversion, blah, blah, blah. So those, these points, the land allocation, these permits, none of this works, obviously, if you're only dealing with it from the community perspective. You can't do that. So one of the things that we do is, where we can, is we try and create a space where people will come together. Um, it, we did it with the Gabon example as well, with the benefit sharing agreements, which is bringing people into the same room and getting them talking about what their expectations are and how it works so that you're creating a whole system that works rather than just representing one view. Um, it meant that communities didn't get everything that they wanted in the way that the benefit sharing agreements worked, but equally it's something that the, the companies agreed to and agreed to commit to over time. So it, it, is a f it is a compromise whether or not it's a fair compromise, you can surely argue, but it's a compromise. On the forest conversion, it's, um, it's frankly a much harder problem. Um, so bringing people together to get into this issue is more difficult. There is a arguably sometimes a stronger consensus between some parts of the private sector and some parts of civil society, and there's quite a, a tussle that goes on between different ministries. So one of the things that you have is ministries who want to be able to grant rights and permits, and, and as I was saying, get the benefit. Bringing ministries together and giving them enough of an incentive to come to an agreement, this is a much bigger challenge. Would you say ministries or the private sector are more cooperative? Depends. Okay. Depends on the day. Depends on the person. <laughs> depends on the context. Um, it can be any. It can be anyone. I think. For me, one of the biggest lessons between in all of this is how much the individual has always mattered. Um, sure, it's the law, and sure, it's the system, but it's actually the individual. Um, no. um, this I just wanted. This is. This goes back to Fier's point about uh, forests and definitions. It's a map of Ivory Coast, and I'm sorry because the legend has come off the bottom of it, which is irritating. Um, all of the bits which are coloured are bits of forest. Uh, what's probably notable there is how much isn't forested land um, from a country which was very significantly forested not so long ago. The dark green is the protected areas. Um, so control over how far it is used. I'm going to try and get this the right way around. These are agroforest areas. This is a whole new type of forestry which is coming along. With the stripes? Yeah, the ones with the stripes going this way. So you can see it's quite a lot of here, 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 here. You can also see it's some of the more accessible places in terms of, of access. Um, one of the questions when dealing with 
land use and who can do what on it is the classification of the forest. So you gazette the forest and then you, you classify. Some are protected areas, some are unprotected. Depending on the country, the language is different, but uh, ultimately it's, you can do certain things and you can't do others. Agroforests are contentious, to say the least, because what is an agroforest? Uh, it can be palm, it can be soy, it can be plantation trees, it can be area which could be classified to be agricultural land later. It depends again on the country. But it is, this is a classification which has been done not that long ago, and it is quite an interesting, to me, indication of just how susceptible the land is to being converted, um, or significantly converted. Good question. So what does it mean to gazette the forest? Uh, almost draw a line around it and oh, say okay. what can happen inside it. Okay. So... This country has a official cassette, uh, which you can pick up the government's session office, and the cassette will announce the decision to create a different forest. And it just gives it a little button. And the thing which is more challenging in some countries than others is finding the map of how the forest has been allocated and what the concession is and who holds it. So you can imagine, I mean, I, I offer you a cliche. I take you from a German system to a system in the Democratic Republic of Congo. I promise you, you will have trouble finding out who is the concession holder for quite a lot of the land in the DRT and what it is being used for and what the taxes have been paid on it. Um, the point, I suppose, what. So, what the work that we have done on this so far is to do looked at the laws which don't in fact exist is what we discovered um, in, so in, in the four countries I mentioned, in Cameroon in Gabon, in Brazil in Indonesia, in Vietnam I think that's it um, to see what was the legal framework, was there a legal framework that governed the way that forests could be converted the answer across the board was no um, Sometimes there were bits that dealt a little better, but generally there was there was no one system in any of those countries which properly defined it. And the things, these are the points that we've picked out and, and focused on um, in terms of what it would take to get a system that works. Land allocation being the most basic and most fundamental, probably, also the most difficult, probably. Um, effective permits, permits to do what, to be held by what type of company in what context. How is timber, the resulting timber, commercialised? The reason for that, it, there are estimates that about 70 to 80 percent of the timber which is now traded is coming from forest conversion. Is it legal? Can timber be legal if it comes from a process which it, there isn't a proper permit for? If so, how? Um, Protection of the environment, because because it isn't a foreseen activity, the sorts of laws that are applied to the way that forest laws, uh, forests are being converted simply don't work. So um, a system which you would use for sustainable, sustainable forestry can't possibly work for forest conversion, because there's no presumption of the land becoming reforested subsequently. And recognition of communities' rights. If communities, right, if communities would get a right from the ongoing use of the timber, from land, what happens when there is no more timber on it? How is a right recognised? Can it be? Um, and all of those are really fundamental and really crucial things which systematically aren't being dealt with yet. Um, when you think about things like the conversion of forests to plantations of different sorts in the context of maybe wanting to get some red objectives and the use of plantations being a useful or a possible mechanism for that, you start to begin to see the implications that this has in terms of land use for a lot of currently forested countries. Um, that's the map. Illegal logging. Um, this is to come back to the EU, uh, or at least dominantly to come back to the EU. Um, there is an EU law that says illegally harvested timber can't be traded on the EU market. It was done as the the counterweight in some ways to those voluntary partnership agreements. Mm. So if you imagine a country enters into a trade agreement with the EU and says, we are going to commit and we will work with the EU to make sure that there is adequate system to be able to guarantee that timber that's exported is legal. Brilliant. Very understandably, and it was Indonesia that first 
uh, made the argument most vocally, why should that timber have to com compete with illegally harvested timber from the rest of the world? So the EU um, recognized this is a valid point and there was enough other voices also calling for something along these lines and brought into, be in, um, into force a piece of legislation to do that. It came into force in 2013. Um, it's pretty obvious that the EU acting on its own can't stop the trade of illegally harvested timber. It's but one market. It was done with the aim of being a bit of a blueprint, a bit of a front runner. Um, it's complementary to other legislation in the USA and Australia. Uh, there have been moves to have other legislation which is similar in other parts of the world. So some exists in Japan, um, although it can be criticized. Um, there are chats of having it in South Korea. There are, dare I even mention it, there is a guideline which have be, has been spoken of for very many years in China which no one has yet seen. But it's the sort of thing. Um, but the aim behind the EU's action in this was uh, is it possible to to both address one's own uh, market access, access to the EU's market itself, but also to do something which has an impact beyond? Arguably, the Australian legislation, which shares bits of the EU's, is a good example that it could have an influence further. Um, our work on this has been to really help the implementation, the enforcement, but also the understanding of the law. Um, in doing it, we've worked across the board with the regulators, with civil society, with NGOs, international and national, and with the private sector, both in the EU but also internationally. Um, the purpose in all of this has been to see how to help make the law work as well as possible on the basis that its underlying intention, underlying aim is a good thing. Um, environmental EU law is famously at the bottom of the rankings for being implemented and enforced well goes to questions of political will, it goes to questions of resourcing, it goes to all of these things. So it has been, uh, it is fair to say, a bit of an uphill battle to make sure that even all of the member states have the correct national laws to implement um, this piece of law properly. Equally, five years after it was brought into force, it is true to say it is working better. Is it working perfectly? Of course it's not. Um, but it is, as opposed to the opportunity that um, the opportunity of being able to also scrutinize the question of what is illegal logging and to use that question in the EU also with EU policymakers who are working on some of the initiatives more internationally to scrutinize this question effectively of forest governance. What makes effective forest governance? Can it work? Um, the types of regulator in the EU who have been enforcing this law have tended to be the forestry department. This creates two really fundamental questions and problems. First of all, how does the forestry department in the UK understand what the laws are in a country the other side of the world if we're importing timber from there? The the mechanism of the timber regulation says you can't import illegally harvested timber and you as a company also have to pay attention, um, do a risk assessment as to whether it's illegal. In the framework of the law, the question of what's legal is set out. There are five categories of law that are set out um, and so legal is understood to be the laws that fall into those categories for the country of harvest. So it's things like, is there a proper permit? Um, have community rights been respected? Have the environmental protections been respected? Go back to the forest conversion question and you see very quickly that there is an overlap here which matters a huge amount. Um, but one of the real issues that we got to at the beginning was the regulator in the UK didn't have a clue to begin to understand what is the law in Ghana? Um, what should I be looking for? What should a company be looking for in terms of how to comply? And what should I as a regulator uh, be looking for in terms of understanding how to oversee and to scrutinize? It has been a very um, consistent question of building understanding, starting from the bottom up, in terms of building the capacity of the regulators and also building the willingness of the regulators and the companies 
to intervene on this law. Um, it is very easy and it is often, it is a mistake that the EU often makes, I think, which is to look outside its own boundaries to the tropical forested world in particular and claim that illegal logging is the problem there and failure of market um, functioning is the, is the problem somewhere else. This is, in one way, a very, very good illustration of the fact that getting laws to work well is not something that happens easily, and that the EU, in creating this law, arguably did something which was a, a very strong and positive message, but in making it work has also to reflect on the weaknesses in EU legislation uh, of actually making it work. Um, what is illegal logging? So, two examples which come from um, the earlier examples. If a benefit sharing agreement hasn't been respected, is it legal? I can argue no, um, because that's one of the preconditions for the timber to have been commercialized. So how could it be otherwise? The practical challenge in making this bite in the EU is providing the information, the evidence, and also helping the regulators understand that this is uh, a relevant question of legality. Again, if timber comes from unregulated forest conversion, can it be legal? Well, on the one hand, there wasn't a law saying you couldn't cut down the, law, the tree. But if you look at what the, I mean, you end up getting into administrative law questions of did the government have the right to do the thing unless it explicitly didn't. Depends on the country. Or you could argue it differently and you could say, actually, no, fundamentally, it, it can't be legal. And these are the sorts of things which get, um, feel difficult, but are important. Um, it is easier to point to whether a timber permit has been used six times for six different, the same timber permit has been fraudulently used six times for six different areas. Um, that's one thing that works in the minds of regulators in the EU. But these sorts of questions are much more complex. One of the reasons that they matter, I guess, is as questions of forests and land and natural resource use continue to have an international dimension to them. And unless this governance, governance works better, there are a huge number of cracks that come through. I give, to finish up, I give an example from Liberia, where there's a pilot red project which is being developed. The red project is meant to come it's a small pilot area. Uh, it is being done at the local level. It's not being done at a national level at the moment. So it's really being done as a case study of it. But there are questions in... What red is? What red is? Oh, sorry. Red. Um, reducing emissions from deforestation and de uh, forest degradation falls under the... Uh, what's it called? Do you uh, well, sort of, although it's got messy. So, projects to encourage companies not, uh, companies not to chop down trees, they're most simplistic. How do you incentivize those either countries or communities or areas or regions not to do it? What's the back and forth? What's it? There's a contract at the basis of all of this or some sort of agreement. One of the issues that is going on with this particular pilot agreement and, and the context as well, Indonesia is one of the countries, uh, Liberia is one of the countries which has had a huge amount of international money pledged to it uh, to make red projects work. So there's a real interest in multiple perspectives in making, making this pilot show that it is possible to do red projects in Liberia. At the moment, no one knows what a carbon right might be. Nothing on it. No one knows who might own it or what the conditions would be for owning it. Or if there was a payment, who that payment would go to, under what terms, for how long, and whether there'd be any kind of database that would make that transparent to be able to happen. These are the, sort of the real nuts and bolts of how would it actually happen in practice. The policy 
policy conversation continue, but the practicality of the national legal framework not matching what the policy framework is asking for and needs to work in practice is a real example of, again, where rights and responsibilities aren't clear. And the sorts of things that, um, if you do not clear up, you will make an absolute mess. Five minutes. Um, uh, b -b 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 that's it. So it depends on the member state, uh, the beauty of EU law being it's up for each member state to do it themselves. Um, I could talk about this for hours and I'm going to control myself. So what the member states do is different depending on the member states. One of the things that the member states have chosen to do is to collect together and look at where their trade, so they look at their trade data, the mm -hmm. customs data, to work out where they're getting timber from, um, do what is probably a fairly arbitrary assessment of which countries look more risky. Combine that with an assessment of what the products are, which are coming from the different countries, and then do particular studies of that product from that country. So they go deep on particular issues and they pull their data according to the countries which have similar supply chains uh, that make it relevant. And off the back of that, do you think? Well, the same people out there, 
have people to send out to get the that, that's not. One of the things that they, that's being used a little bit is DNA and isotope testing. So there's DNA and isotope testing that you can do to, to connect, uh, to analyze whether timber is of the species that it uh, this is claimed and also whether it comes from the area and the, the country or the sub-region um, that it is claimed. If that doesn't match, there's a strong argument to say that the company couldn't possibly understand properly the risk of illegality because it's misunderstood where the timber came from. So DNA testing is being used a little bit. But a lot of the time it is much more a question of um, they are they are able to fault companies more easily more than that simply by asking has the company asked the right questions at the right point. And, um, at this stage, the answer is still quite often there. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about the trade agreements that are existing as well as negotiated, being negotiated? Yep. And compare it in terms of how are they they're shaping the governments of countries such as Ghana in a sense. They are um, like EPA or you know, the Economic Partnership Agreement or Free Trade Agreements compared with that. And how are they shaping and weakening the governments? Structure. Do you mean the ones which aren't the timber specific ones? Mm, not really timber, but the environment. Um, uh, so the trade agreements or the investment agreements that I'm aware of with the countries that we know best are not environment led, let's be very clear. They're trade or investment led. Mm -hmm. So they will have, um, they all have provisions to some extent on governments or sustainable use of natural resources or transparency in certain provisions or um, a clear allocation of rights. Something and they'll have something along those levels. But the issue is it's the follow up. So to the extent that it's um, the TSD which I spoke about the trade and sustainability um, sustainable development section of the Indonesia trade agreement is I think quite typical in this respect, which is that it doesn't have enforcement provisions. So you have a lot of the rest of the trade agreement which does, and then you have the section that doesn't. I suppose in terms of what that does for governance, to me, politically, it weakens the focus. Um, so it is, there is a push and a pull on all of this, which is going on with the EU, or I suppose other countries also, speaking with multiple voices, depending on the issues that they're dealing with.
Thank you.